Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Velma Scantaberry, and I am here representing the Dialysis Patient Citizens Educational Center. It's 1229, and we have another minute to go before we get started. So I hope you are at lunch, taking a break, excited to be here as we are telling more of our friends and our families to come on and join this platform. So I thank you so much. And today is a beautiful Monday in April. And we are here to talk to you about kidney disease, patients on dialysis, patients with kidney transplant, any information you would like to know. You know, and here in the US, there are over 785,000 people on dialysis. Over 70% of those are on dialysis, are with kidney disease, let me correct you, 785,000 people with end-stage kidney disease. And over 70 to 72% of those are on dialysis. And the, the rest are 20-something uh, percent uh, have received a kidney transplant. So there are many more patients on dialysis uh, who are looking for a better quality of life. And we here at the Dialysis Patient Citizens Educational Center, we are excited to bring to you this first live chat here on Instagram. And we are here to answer your questions. Uh, my name is Dr. Scantaberry, and I have been a transplant surgeon for over 32 years. Recently retired from practicing surgery, but I am in education and uh, continue to advocate for patients on behalf of those patients who are uh, have issues, whether it's access to care, making sure that they uh, have a correct diagnosis, that they get quality care, uh, and that they are really have uh, their questions answered when they go to the doctor. So many of us are afraid to uh, ask our doctor's questions or be intimidated by our physicians. So it becomes so important to have that conversation. And we're here today to be able to answer any of the questions you may have. So I invite you to ask some questions uh, because it's important as a uh, as our um, website has many different resources for you to be able to have more and more information, whether it's on staying healthy, questions about quality of life, uh, resources, different news. We also send out a newsletter to be able to uh, reach all our patients. And so it becomes important to uh, get this information. And so for patients, whether it's about getting on dialysis, whether it's about what workup you need to get on dialysis, why tests are needed, you know, as you as you are on dialysis and you are uh, getting your kidneys uh, filtered through, whether it's hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, many of patients are should should qualify and may be in need of a kidney transplant. And so you may wonder what does it take to go through the process, and so. Uh, you can refer yourself. It's important to understand that, that you can actually uh, call up the transplant center and uh, refer yourself if you feel that you haven't been appropriately referred. And they will assess you. They will see, they will obtain your records. They will get that information from your doctors. And basically your goal is to be able to make sure that you are healthy uh, and that you are not with, that you don't have any cancers. Uh, the biggest thing is in terms of heart disease. We know many of our patients with uh, the two primary causes of uh, main causes for end stage kidney disease are diabetes and high blood pressure. And both of these diseases can cause heart disease. And if a pa even for patients who do not have or may have end stage renal disease due to, say, um, IgA nephropathy. Uh, you know that as your kidneys fail, you will develop high blood pressure. That's just one of the the uh, symptoms of kidney disease, as well as one of the causes of kidney disease. So patients who may not have had high blood pressure will have high blood pressure once the kidneys start to fail, and sometimes even uh, on dialysis. And so uh, heart disease is uh, can be caused by high blood pressure. And so when you combine 
diabetes and high blood pressure and end-stage kidney disease it increases your risk of heart disease so, so patients getting worked up for kidney transplant it becomes important for us to assess your heart and to really make sure that your heart can uh, have not suffered uh, major consequences from being on dialysis uh, and that also that you will survive uh, but most importantly we diagnose and can uh, oftentimes uh, find things that you may not be aware of, that you have had a heart attack before, that you may need your heart fixed, things that may not be obvious while you're on dialysis. So those things are important to understand uh, that even though you may feel that uh, there's a lot to do to even get on the transplant list, they, these things, the tests that they put you through are educational, if nothing else. You learn about the things that you can do to gain, get to better health, whether it's improving your cholesterol, whether it's losing weight, whether it's getting your heart fixed. And so many times we diagnose patients who uh, may not have known that they had a cancer because now we're really putting you through the ringer to make sure that you don't have any underlying cancer. So we want to make sure that you get your prostate check, that you get your mammogram and that you get your colonoscopy. So those are things that are done uh, that if you have not had them routinely while you're uh, as a kidney uh, a dialysis patient or someone with kidney failure, even if you're not on dialysis, it becomes important to really uh, get those things. And um, as for patients, there's a question there that says, new patients who skip treatments, what advice do you give? Well, it's, it's important not to skip treatments because you have to remember if your kidneys were working, you wouldn't need dialysis. And so on a regular basis, when your kidney is working, your body is able to filter and get rid of all those waste products. Now you're going to dialysis three days a week, or if you're doing it home dialysis, then you're unlikely to skip. But just remember, your body really needs to get those waste products out. And the more you you conduct your dialysis and stick to your regimen, uh, it's filtering your body. So don't skip, don't skip treatments because the more toxins accumulate within your body uh, and can cause detrimental effects to some of your organs. So it's important. The, to understand that you're not filtering your body every day. So the days that you need to go, you really should be um, uh, really being compliant with your dialysis treatment. And um, so Peter's asking, what are the most significant factors contributing to long-term success and quality of life for patients on dialysis? And, you know, the thing is about being on dialysis is remember that when patients hit dialysis, some patients continue to urinate and others do not. So if you are urinating, then you're actually getting some volume out. But for some patients, it may be very little, a cup a day, but nothing near normal. So the problem is you cannot consume more than you can burn up. So then your body has to actually work with that. As I say, you gain five kilos or 10 pounds, 12 pounds between dialysis treatments. That's a problem because your heart now has to work with that extra load of fluid and that can cause wear and tear on your heart over time. So compliance and at least this, the major factors contributing to long-term success is limiting your volume and not challenging your heart. So you want to not have those extreme gains and then having to take off that 12, 15 pounds in four hours. Long-term success is better when you can dialyze more often when you can do it on a daily basis and allow it to be a process that's close to normal as opposed to every other day it's about exercising it's about controlling your blood pressure about doing all the other things that you need to do outside of being on dialysis because your risk of heart disease increases the longer you're on dialysis so you want to monitor the other factors that may be contributing to your kidney disease such as diabetes is it, you know is your is your hemoglobin a1c better is it under control are you exercising to keep your 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 muscles strong but the biggest issue for patients on dialysis is underlying heart disease uh, and a lot of that contributed to uh, with people on hemodialysis uh, uh, and made better when you're on home dialysis and you have more frequent dialysis uh, better for your heart system 
And so it's important to be compliant, controlling your phosphorus, controlling your calcium levels, all those things can lead to um, major consequences long term. Nancy has a question, is transplant a cure? No, it's not a cure. Not everyone will qualify for uh, uh, to be a kidney transplant uh, a candidate because we look at whether or not getting that kidney is going to improve your longevity uh, and also your quality of life. And for some patients, their underlying problems may be so severe that getting a transplant does not do anything for those underlying issues. So it becomes important to know that if you're getting a transplant, the goal of the, that transplant evaluation is to make sure that you will survive that transplant and that your underlying medical status can handle the medications, can handle the drugs, can handle the surgery, and that your outcome is still going to be good. So let's say you come to us for transplant uh, and we diagnose you with um, with a cancer. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you are ruled out uh, to be a candidate, but we, you may be treated for that cancer uh, and the doctors assess you to say, what is the, at what point are we sure that you're going to have a great success now that remove that cancer. And so for some people, they may need to wait five years uh, depending on the cancer. They may need to make a year depending on the stage of that cancer. But after that five years, and we see that you know have no recurrence or whatever the, the time frame may be, then uh, then we will say we put you on the list. And so we'll still monitor your risk for cancer, uh, but you can still get transplanted because we know that patients who've had this cancer can still live a long time. So that that is what is important to understand that at this point, at one point in time, you may not be a candidate. It's not a cure, but our goal is to have you have a better life off dialysis. And the more you're off dialysis, the better your overall system is because now your heart can go back to uh, pumping regularly. It doesn't have, you can urinate out that extra volume. Uh, you don't have, you, some patients may still need to take Lasix depending on how well the kidney is working, but the goal is to be able to have you put out that extra volume so that you're not gaining weight between uh, as you were while you're on dialysis. And some patients will lose some extra weight because they're holding on to, they were holding on to an extra 10 pounds that was all fluid before they got transplanted. Um, a question, some doctors don't share a lot of information perhaps because they don't want to scare patients. What should we do to get more information about improving your health? Uh, you know, certainly the even the Dialysis Patient Citizen Education Center website does give uh, more information about things you can do to improve your health. If you think about the regular things to improve your health, uh, you, we all know we need our cancer screening. You know, we want to make sure that you you get your colonoscopy, you get your mammogram, pap smear, so you don't you don't add that as a consequence or an issue along with your health. You want to control your blood pressure. And, you know, our society is, is you know, you want to exercise. You want to, you know, I say calories in, calories out. We all gain weight. We all struggle with weight. Um, I, you know, BMI is not a great tool, but it's what we use. But you want to make sure that you are health, a healthy weight and that you can still, you know, you don't want to be out of breath when you climb a a flight of stairs. So you want your heart is a muscle and you want to exercise your heart. So just as the rest of your muscles, you want them to be strong. So you want to be able to make sure you watch your cholesterol. Fast foods are not good for anyone, regardless of whether you're in dialysis or not, because it's high in salt, they're high in fat, uh, and they increase our cholesterol. So you want to be able to eat those things that are healthy, uh, now more fruit and vegetables. I know as dialysis patients, you do have some restrictions, but you want to stay healthy outside of uh, things you would be doing had you not been on um, had kidney disease, and that all contributes to better health. Uh, how 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 have recent technological advances impacted the efficiency and patient experience during dialysis treatments? I think you know one of the things that's important is that we are moving towards um, more frequent dialysis, home dialysis, because we want to be able to, you know, you eat and we eat two meals a day, three meals a day, depending on uh, your consumption. Uh, but for most of us, we, if your kidneys are normal, you 
you pee on a regular basis four or six times a day uh, and you have a bowel movement, you get rid of those waste products. But for dialysis patients, the fact that you're only doing it three days a week is going to be detrimental to your system long term uh, unless you cut it, cut back your intake. Uh, and that's why it's so important to control your volume. So better experience, patient experience come with uh, if you can do dialysis five days a week, if you can do dialysis six days a week, because then whatever you consume, you're allowing the machine to rinse out uh, and to take care of those metabolites for that day. Uh, and so it becomes, a, it puts your body in more homeostasis, I should say, in the fact that now you're able to get rid of those those waste products. Many of us know when you're constipated and not going to the bathroom on a daily basis, we feel miserable. It's almost like you're backed up. So just imagine that, uh, that that's the system that your body has to live with over time. So it's important to be able to uh, say, how often can I do night dialysis? Can I do it for eight hours as opposed to four hours? Can I do it... Can I do it daily? Is this something I can do more often? Um, uh, so it becomes important to be able to look at opportunities to be able to improve your dialysis treatments. Just imagine if you gain 15 pounds or 12 pounds between the two days that you were not on dialysis and now you go to dialysis and you're expected to take off that 12 pounds in four hours you will be cramping because now you're trying to squeeze your body and get all that fluid off, because, but it took you two days to do it. Now you're trying to take it off in four hours and your body is going to react to that. You're not going to feel well. You're going to feel lightheaded. You're going to feel miserable after that because you put it on slowly, but you're taking it off very fast. And so that is your, will put your heart into distress and some people at the end of dialysis have to get some fluid back because now you're feeling miserable and you're cramping. So it becomes important to try to be compliant and you will have a better experience uh, on dialysis when you, when you have less fluid to take off. So being compliant with that, if you're not urinating, becomes uh, uh, important to do. So I really thank you for all your questions. It's important to be able to uh, really have this conversation because you need to understand the benefits. Patients say, you know, I don't feel well, so I'm not going to dialysis. Well, maybe you're not feeling well because your system is out of whack and it can be corrected with dialysis, getting that extra fluid off. Maybe your heart's being challenged too much because you had a rough weekend and you did some things you weren't supposed to do. What is creatinine? Creatinine really is a measure of your kidney function in terms of uh, whether your body is able to excrete the things that it needs to excrete. So if it's working well, uh, your creatinine should be uh, below one or close to one. Uh, as we get older, you know, our kidneys uh, get be, are no longer as perfect as they were. And so your creatinine may drift up somewhat, but it still, you still may be 60% or 75% depending on your age, especially if you have two kidneys. Um, if you have one, uh, certainly for many patients who are dialysis, the creatinine with, uh, with, may have one kidney, but the creatinine may be 1.5, but that's still great because they only have one kidney. Depends on what it is and what you started out to be. So this creatinine measures kidney function. Uh, as your body is becomes unable to process and get rid of your metabolites, then your uh, and your kidney, your creatinine goes up somewhat. Creatinine itself in the number can vary from day to day, depending on if you're dehydrated, whether you had a bout of loose stools, uh, things that can alter your creatinine. So many, oftentimes the doctor will look beyond creatinine and look at your creatinine clearance overall, which is uh, a better way of looking at. Uh, what your kidneys are doing because day-to-day -day creatinine will be would vary if you didn't drink a lot of fluid or if you don't uh, you had a lot to take in so that's very if your creatinine continues to go up from one to two to three you know there's a problem so you want to be able to follow that and so it becomes one of those things where you want to also know your numbers we talk about blood pressure and and your blood sugar and your cholesterol one of the things we should also add to that list is what is your creatinine and what is it from year to year and what's, what is it doing so that you can know whether you're stable or there's a question uh, or there's something to be concerned about.
Peter asking, how do you determine the optimal dialysis modality for individual patients considering factors such as lifestyle, comorbidities, and personal preferences? And so when you reach that point of needing a kidney replacement therapy, that's a conversation you should have with your nephrologist where they're, you're supposed, you should be given the options for dialysis. Here are the options. Uh, kidney transplant is an option. Do you want to get on the transplant list? Do you want to, uh, what about dialysis? Uh, Perineal dialysis versus hemodialysis. Most patients will start out if they don't, you know, if they're healthy and able, not healthy, but if they're willing to do peritoneal dialysis where they do it on their own, uh, depending on their lifestyles, uh, if they're working full time and they rather do this at home at night, all those things are discussed with your nephrologist as well as your, you know, who's going to help you with it. Are you comfortable doing it and your personal preferences? So thus a conversation that you and your nephrologist would decide uh, what's the best, uh, what's the best modality for you. Uh, sometimes patients are told if it's an acute situation and you've been diagnosed in the emergency room or in the hospital, you will likely need to start hemodialysis urgently because to uh, because of the need to get these metabolites and to get all these bad things out of your body. But then you can come back and say, I don't like, uh, is it possible if they put a catheter in your neck and you need urgent dialysis, you will need come back and have a fistula place that you can then have it done in your arm. Or you may want to think about, is there another way I could do this? You know, can I do peritoneal dialysis? Uh, how do I get to home dialysis? How do how do I get trained? So those are things that are conversations you have with your nephrologist and your dialysis team. And generally, there's an there's a, that patient education that occurs uh, before uh, or at the time that you're initiating uh, uh, dialysis. Uh, how can in-center dialysis patients become comfortable with home dialysis as a treatment option? And certainly that's uh, another uh, opportunity to talk to your nephrologist or nurse practitioner in your dialysis center uh, as to what are the options for home dialysis in terms of getting trained, having the machine at home, are you comfortable doing it? Generally, they'll train you in center first to see how you're doing uh, to see whether you can do it at home. I know uh, the rules have changed that you have to have someone at home with you. Now, I don't think is required as most patients, but certainly you want to be able to make sure you're safe uh, and that you're able, you're comfortable sticking yourself. So um, generally the dialysis staff will go through those those modalities with you to see whether you're a good candidate to be able to do this by yourself at home. But it always helps if you have someone in the house with you who can assist you during those times because it is it certainly allows you to do it at your leisure. Some people can do it in you know in the evening while they're at the home uh, and after at the end of the day and you can do it five, six times a week, which makes it a lot easier on your on your body. So thank you so much for these wonderful questions and allow us to have this ongoing conversation. So I thank you all for joining. This has been great. I thank you for all the questions and the enthusiasm. Uh, another question, if I had a cancer, can I still be eligible for a transplant? Uh, for most cancers, yes. It all depends on the aggressiveness of the cancer, the stage of the cancer and the type of cancer. Uh, you know, it depends, uh, certainly if you have a cancer and it has already metastasized and it's a stage four, then you're not a candidate because it's already in many different parts of your, your body. If it's a stage one or two, that's amenable to treatment uh, and it can be removed. Some patients, if let's say for instance in breast cancer, they may have a surgery, plus they may need to go through uh, a couple years of chemotherapy. And so for even for patients who will require chemotherapy, we work with the oncologist to see what is the longevity uh, and the likelihood that this cancer uh, will not reoccur. And so if it's assumed that you should do well for 10 years or even greater than that, the, the risk of, it, of recurrence is very minimal. Uh, with follow-up, uh, you may still need to be on certain medications for a while, uh, but when you finish that chemotherapy and you're cleared by your oncologist, we're working with the oncologist, they tell us that you're cleared and it's safe to go ahead with transplant, 
then we will proceed with transplant. And so you still need to be monitored by your oncologist. We still make sure that you you um, you follow up. And I know some patients have been cleared from one cancer and then while they have had a transplant a couple of years later, so they develop another cancer, whether it's a colon cancer, why, which is why screening is so important. We wanna make sure you have those screenings so that we don't complicate your treatment. If you have a kidney transplant and you then you, uh, have cancer and we have to treat you for that cancer, yes, we're going to focus on that cancer because that can be a cause of your death, not the not kidney disease. And so we may alter your immunosuppression so that you may be able to get that uh, get that chemotherapy that you need to. So uh, thank you for that question. Is there an age limit for kidney transplant? Uh, this varies by program and also in terms of um, uh, area of the country. Some patients, most patients, most uh, transplant centers will transplant patients up to age 75. If you are already on the transplant list and have been waiting for many years and you hit 75, they will generally give you a great spirit to see if you're coming up for a transplant. And so generally one to two years after that, if you happen to be getting called, they may give you some options. But if you're coming to transplant uh, at age 73 or 74, um, so many programs will not put you on the list, and, but would recommend that you find a living donor who will be able to give you a kidney and then you're not competing uh, with all the thousands of patients on the transplant list. So it becomes important that the older you get, uh, if there's, especially if you're a blood type O, which is the majority of which patients are waiting for transplant, you're 72 in blood type O. It's unlikely that considering the vast number of people who are on the list before you, uh, unless you happen to have 10 years on dialysis, uh, that you will get transplanted. So those things become important. There, there were a few programs in, in uh, Philadelphia who had transplant in an 80 year old, but I'm not sure if that's still, but you wouldn't find many programs who are transplanting patients over that age, mostly because as we get older, our risk factors for death increase. And so you may, uh, you may survive the kidney, but die of other issues. And so it becomes how well is your heart? How much strength do you have? Will we be able to get you out of the hospital at 75 or would you end up in rehab? Uh, do you have the ability to bounce back? Uh, and so the goal is to provide you with quality of life, but if your life quality is already poor, there may not be much to add except getting you off of dialysis only to have you dive under underlying problems. So that becomes a, a issue of really looking at age when we consider age in terms of uh, what we can, um, how well we can help you. How can we improve the screening and early detection of kidney disease to reduce the need for dialysis? And yeah, unfortunately, because kidney disease is a silent disease and we attribute, oh, I'm a little tired, um, I don't feel so well, we think there's other things going on, it's really important to get checked, it's really important to get that annual exam, it's really important to uh, you know, encourage the Kidney Foundation to have these KEEP programs, which are very excellent ways of monitoring our community, but we have to put our creatinine and our kidney function on our radar when we get our annual exams. We want to make sure that if you're not diabetic, you shouldn't really have protein in your urine. So getting your urine checked, especially for so many young people who are out there who uh, we miss kidney disease early on because they don't get the urine checked. Uh, and that protein order can be a signal that something may be wrong. So I think as we add to um, it, our goal really is to get that education. We focus on high blood pressure and diabetes. We focus on heart disease and cholesterol. But knowing your creatinine number and knowing whether or not you have protein in your urine becomes important to, to, uh, for early screening. So add that as a marker when you go to your doctor to make sure that we, each and every one of us should be keeping check of what our numbers are. Uh, so that we can follow and see and have that record for ourselves, have that investment in ourselves to be able to know uh, what is what is going on inside my body. Do I need to do better? Do I, is my is my urine color darker than it should be? Maybe should I be urinating more? Uh, and that the silence, the, there's not many sy symptoms of kidney disease. 
uh, and until patients feel really, really terrible and they end up in the emergency room and then they're told that the kidneys have failed and they need urgent dialysis. So pay attention to what's going on in your body. If your legs are swelling, generally that's a late sign. It could also be from heart disease. Uh, and But it, those, that's a signal that, uh, that something is wrong also. So I really uh, appreciate the time here and all the questions that have been asked. Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation and uh, I think that this is uh, something that we are starting. Uh, this is the first of a series and I look forward to uh, doing this again uh, and I think it's a good way to draw people in to uh, social media to answer your questions and to have this ongoing discussion. So I look forward to doing this again uh, next month. We will alternate between Facebook and Instagram. Uh, so definitely uh, check us out at Dialysis Patient Citizens Educational Center uh, on both Facebook and uh, Instagram. Uh, and please comment, let us know you're there, post your questions so that we can really see what your interests are. If there are topics you would like to discuss, let us know. Uh, and um, it, we will be able to supply uh, the information that you need. So uh, what, whatever your interest is, please um, post a comment, post a question. Uh, we look forward to joining you again next month. And thank you so much. Have a great and a wonderful day. We're at the top of the hour. And for all of you who have joined, thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, have a wonderful week. Bye now.